Crowdfunding for music reached both a financial and an infamous peak in 2012 with Amanda Palmer's $1.2 million album fundraiser on Kickstarter. Her decision to subsequently ask local musicians to play on stage with her for free caused a massive backlash, and the crowds moved to other platforms like Pledge Music and Patreon to fund musicians. In the last few years, however, Kickstarter has quietly returned to the music arena with several successful projects and ahead of music. Welcome to the future of what? I'm your host, Portia Sabin, president of the independent record label, Kill Rockstars. Today, we talk to Molly Newman, the head of music at Kickstarter, and to Jack Stratton of Wolfpack, a band that is using Kickstarter as one part of their out-of-the-box approach to being a working band. It's all coming up on The Future of What. Can I have a taste of your ice cream? You're listening to The Future of What. We're talking to Molly Newman, head of music at Kickstarter. Molly, welcome to The Future of What. Thank you so much, Portia. So you are the fairly new head of music at Kickstarter. You've been in that job for a bit. Yes, just a year. Yes, just a year. But it's a new position at Kickstarter, which is funny, I think, because when most people think about Kickstarter, they probably think about music because, you know, you guys were the first on the scene when crowdfunding started and also the Amanda Palmer crowdfunding on Kickstarter is like, you know, ah, the, the gold standard, right, right. The, the famous crowdfunding thing. But interestingly enough, music is not really Kickstarter's total bread and butter, is it? That's right. So Kickstarter, I think creative projects, so art and film and dance and music are sort of the core DNA of the company. And certainly the original idea for Kickstarter came from one of our founders wanting to bring some DJs from Germany to New Orleans where he was a student and sort of like trying to to sort of, you know, get his community to pull together and find the money to bring them over. And I guess it didn't really end up happening. Uh That was in the early 2000s, but that was the inspiration for the idea of Kickstarter. And our current CEO and co-founder, Yancy Strickler, was a music journalist. He is a colleague of mine at eMusic 10 years ago when I was there. So there's a a real sort of core of music that runs through the company in lots of different ways. And actually, there are tons of musicians that work in different areas besides the music team. But we had never had a head of music prior to me joining. And that was part of a strategy for, you know, certain categories to have someone who could join from a a senior position within the industries that they were connected to and help grow that connection and deepen it. And I think part of my main mission over the past year has been to strengthen those alliances so that we can ultimately be a resource source for the whole music community and not just primarily unsigned artists that are of the DIY profile that I think besides Amanda historically has been sort of what people associate with Kickstarter music projects, the bread and butter, if you will, like you said, or, you know, the, the categories that are really strong and, you know, do sort of spectacular numbers are more the design and technology projects and games. So games and, and particularly board games and card games are tremendous here. It's a crazy ecosystem that really supports those kinds of creators and has been really inspiring to me in terms of what I hope that we can ultimately do and accomplish here. And that was one of the things that, you know, attracted me to joining the company is that it wasn't just about music, that there were all these different areas of community and the creative pursuits that I could learn from and hopefully help strengthen what we have to offer. So it's been pretty fascinating. In the past year, we now have a new most funded project, which was the Voyager Golden Record that launched in September and closed in October, and it raised $1.3 million. Whoa. Yeah, it was amazing. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So yeah, it's it's a brand new label that's called Ozma Records. It's based out of San Francisco, and they teamed up to run a project to release the it was like an audio time capsule that went up with the Voyager spacecraft 40 years ago. And I think the licenses were pretty extensive. And so they, they needed some financial resources to get them. And then the the project just took off and it was its own sort of self 
propelling force. I would see friends of mine on Facebook who, you know, never talk about Kickstarter projects and never share them. Like, I just backed this. This is the coolest thing. <laughs> and it sort of went from there. And I saw like, oh my God, this is on track to raise over a million dollars. And then, oh my God, it's looking like it's going to pass what Amanda did with her project, which was almost 1.2. So that was pretty wild, you know, and, and, and to me, it hit a couple of things. One is the power of the platform. Like, you know, when an idea has a lot of dimensions that work with our I guess, core demographic, you know, this project had space, history, music, a beautiful physical box set, and a great story. And that really attracted people on lots of different dimensions. So that's sort of the power of the platform to bring all of those things together. And then it it made a lot of sense to me as an example of smart business. So this is a new company. It's a new label. They knew that they had an interesting idea that there would be support for their goal wasn't $1.3 million. It was 200 something or just around there. And they knew that this was an interesting way to get support and visibility and profiles for their label as they started. And so that's something that I'm quite excited about. As you know, my background is primarily with labels and lots of different ways. And I don't want our company to be about disrupting and replacing labels. I want us to be about strengthening our whole business and our whole community. And I thought that that was a really amazing demonstration of that possibility. Absolutely. And it's also interesting because it just goes to show that Kickstarter is not just a platform for indie rock. That's right. You know, we're not just talking about one genre. There's huge amount of possibility and, and options within that for startup labels, for, you know, whoever we're talking to. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like from what you're saying, the best way to think about approaching a Kickstarter project is really to have like a great business plan. And, and a story, right? So yeah. something, I mean, we unfortunately see a number of projects every day that launch that sort of have, you know, I'm trying to do this and there's not much to them. And so some of those projects never get one pledge and never get $1. One thing that's really, you know, amazing about Kickstarter is it's very transparent, you know, right. sometimes it might be a challenge in, in how transparent we are, but I think it's a strength. I'm very proud of the fact that you can see so much about what we do and what things work and, and what things, you know, there's, a, there's possibly more potential for, but, you know, if you go in and you see some projects that don't have anything going for them, it's probably because they haven't done, like you said, the homework, the, the plan. And when you do, you would, you know, gauge your goal expectation to, you know, sort of what your community size might be. So if you're a small band, you would, you know, make sure that your, your goal made sense within your, you know, the people that are maybe going to your shows or that you're engaging with online. But if there's a story there and something that we can get behind and support, more often than not, we're very eager to help grow the support for your projects. Yeah, I just find crowdfunding so fascinating because we've watched it develop over the last, whatever, 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. It's just such an interesting method because I think, you know how everything goes through stages of cool and not cool. Yes. You know, it's like, oh, sure. Oh, we think that's so <laughs> cool. You know, it's like social media is just all over this. Like people love it and they share it and they do all this stuff. And then it's like something happens. Everyone's like, oh, that's not cool anymore. We're not going to pay right. attention to that. Right. And they move to some other source. But I feel like Kickstarter is kind of interesting because, as you said, so maybe the music part was cool in the beginning and then kind of went to not cool. But then all these other aspects of, I mean, card games, I seriously would never have guessed would be a massive crowdfunding, (laughs) you know, genre or whatever. Yeah. That's fascinating. It is. And and when I look at the success that the games category is having, what they've been able to do is demonstrate, you know, a solution for a part of that industry that was not being nurtured by the major stakeholders. So the equivalent of perhaps the major record companies not developing artists. And then really empowering that sort of entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, game creators, I think by design are, you know, planners and, you know, methodical and looking at things and strategic. So it's not too much of a leap for them to say, okay, what do I need to do here to make my goal happen? Right. And that's a little bit of a challenge in music, honestly. You know, I mean, I (laughs) I work, the people that I work with and the music projects, and I say this having been an artist and having been a manager, and there's a massive amount of vulnerability 
that is sort of inherent in being someone who expresses themselves and their emotions in, in their music. And then there's a massive amount of sort of gravitas or, you know, ego, if you will, that's also necessary to get up on stage and perform that. So right. those aren't always complimentary. And I think sometimes <laughs> those qualities are what make running a campaign a little bit even extra scary for musicians versus maybe a gamer or a filmmaker or something else, because those vulnerabilities that you are touching, you know, sort of like, here's a campaign, I'm asking for your support. Those aren't always the easiest things to sort of stomach. And so one of the things that I really try to communicate and and when I'm talking to artists and potential people who are going to do campaigns, it's about those are completely legitimate concerns and anxieties. And I could never say like, oh, don't worry about that. Because for a campaign to be successful, the person who's running it or who's the, the main subject of it generally needs to be pretty involved and pretty encouraging. Like they need to be part of the messaging and the story. But if we can make that story and message be more about celebrating the thing that they're trying to make, the creativity, the community that they're coming from, and more about bringing those people along that journey, I think it's more genuine. It's more exciting. And I think that the community behind who supports those artists are generally, you know, eager to help. So, you know, those are sort of, you know, that's like messaging fine tuning kind of thing, right? but it's important. And I think that's just been, again, part of what I've been trying to do over this past year, changing a little bit of the perception, less about the ask. And, you know, I think one of the things that people say to us, like, I don't want to seem like I'm begging and how can we help musicians and people running the campaigns feel better about that so that they don't feel like vulnerable or anxious or less so. Right. I get that anxiety is sort of an inherent part of running a campaign. And honestly, <laughs> over this past year, that's been very, uh, you know, I think we've all been more attuned to that than ever. <laughs> yeah, definitely. was Love Thing by Bratmobile. If you're enjoying this program, please subscribe to our show on iTunes. To find out what's coming up next, follow us on Twitter at KRSFOW. I mean, obviously, there's some artists that have already got a community put together that can completely support them Mm -hmm. on Kickstarter. The example that we're talking about today is Wolfpack. Yes. You know, we spoke to Jack Stratton about, you know, they just did a campaign in 2016. They raised over $100,000 for their new album. Yep. And it was like, as he said, it was it was like it was under the radar. It was like nobody even noticed. It just <laughs> happened in this like really organic and just quiet way. You know, it's, yeah. they didn't have to do a ton of marketing. They just kind of put it out there and, and you know, their fans showed up and gave and boom, the album happened. And completely, you know, that's that's an amazing, you know, I love I love that because it to me, that's what crowdfunding was meant to do originally. It's like, yeah, get something that people really want. And all you're basically saying is exactly in my mind, it's exactly like the pre-orders we do at Kill Rockstars. It's like, right. look, we're putting this thing out. If you really want it, here's your opportunity to pay for it up front. 
you know, three months from now, you'll actually get it in your hands. But pre-orders are, you know, a super great way to do it because then at least we get some money so that we can press that vinyl or whatever. Yes. It's an identical situation for artists or labels or whoever on Kickstarter. That's right. Yeah, no, and, it, and that was the first campaign of Wolfpack that I had been a part of. He's done, I'm just verifying how many campaigns he's done because I think it's seven. Yeah, it's a lot. Seven created, yeah. including this yeah. one. So, you know, what I think one of the clear things that he was able to do is build on those campaigns, you know, and really yeah. sort of, you know, create credibility within his own community to be, this This is some place that could just help amplify that pre-order. So, yeah, he could have done it on his website or through Twitter, but the being on Kickstarter and having sort of the international breadth and reach that we have over 10 million and people have backed the project on Kickstarter. We've had over 24,000 successful music projects. And, you know, so he has he's just been through being consistent and having it be part of his, if you will, toolkit. He's been able to really build something that is a great business model. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he releases his own music. I think the timing of the release was really clever, too, if I'm not mistaken. It was up through all the digital services, sort of almost immediately as well. Like he just had everything lined up and we were part of his marketing strategy and just helped it grow. And because he had such historic success with us, we knew that as soon as the campaign was coming up, that it would get tagged a certain way to be extra visible within the website and and be in more recommendations. We would share it with our social channels and our newsletter and just really try to help grow it as much as we can. And that's definitely one of our overarching goals for the company is like, how can we help our creators exceed their goals? One of the things that I'm really focused on is not having in line with what I was saying before about reducing anxiety. If you're creeping over the finish line, so say you're a successful creator, but you're just like at the last day, the 11th hour, like that's not a good experience and that's not really (laughs) successful, right? right? So if we can help get projects to be successful earlier in their campaign cycle and then the rest of it is really about the celebration and bringing them in and using some of the new features that we have. So we have now a live stream functionality. I think Rockstars, when you guys did a recent project there was like a, a fun sort of you know live stream thing that happened and yeah <laughs> there's just you know different different things that can add some dimension to the campaigns that are not the core but are helping engage the community in, in new ways so we're looking at a lot of different things along those lines for this year and next yeah we love the kickstarter live feature and even jack stratton was talking about how didn't they do a live telethon like they did like a, they probably a goofy did. <laughs> They did this goofy telethon where like you could phone in and they like made it as much like a 70s public radio telethon (laughs) that used to be televised in our youth. Exactly. I mean, he's a perfect artist to do it because his fans are part of the party. Right. He's obviously he's a clever guy. He's looking at different ways to make the current economy for music work. And I think he's doing a really good job. And I hope that other people who are of his profile, you know, sort of self-released independent artists who have a fan base who prefer to be entrepreneurial or, you know, self-released, look at it as, a, as for some inspiration, because I think it is something of what it takes now. Uh, and I don't think it means if you're doing a Kickstarter campaign or if you're signed to kill rock stars, I think you have to be engaged with your community. You have to be communicative. You have to think about, you know, the story and your presentation in ways that in my history, my, my personal community, you know, that wasn't part of what we wanted to do. We wanted to like make music, tour, hang out, talk about the things that we are passionate about, but not really think about the marketing and the, the label work. And I think now, even if you're signed to a label, you have to be a little bit more comprehensive in how you're approaching the business because it's just that much harder. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, that's exactly where we're at these days is creating new revenue streams or taking advantage of the revenue streams that exist Mm -hmm. and cobbling them together. I think the thing that you said earlier about, you know, the thing that makes a successful campaign is true for Kickstarter. It's true for Kill Rockstars. It's true for everybody is you got to have a story of some sort. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, people like Jack Stratton just prove that you also have to be creative and think outside the box. And I think the people who are doing the best right now are the ones who are saying, hey, this is a crazy idea. Let's try it, you know, and I I think that captures people's imagination because like you said, you know, I mean, you know, if every single band who tries to start a Kickstarter 
is like, hi, we've played one time and, you know, we've got three <laughs> friends and one of them is my mom, you know, and we want to raise money for this album for music that no one's ever heard. You know, it's like that's the same story. You know, that's just everybody's yeah. mm-hmm. everybody's story until you get past that point. So it's like you just even if that's your actual story, you got to find a way to make it more interesting <laughs> to, yes, yes. to capture people. Right. Like, and, you know, I mean, maybe the downside isn't really that bad if it reveals itself that, yeah, there's a lot of people that aren't prepared yet to go out and do what it takes in the current climate. And maybe they need to go back and do a little more work, even beyond just getting their start, you know, running a campaign, raising $2,500 to record, raising five grand, whatever it is, like something that's manageable. And I, when I look at it, it's like, okay, I mean, you could probably do that with, you know, 250 people or, you know, 300 people, you could raise $7,500 if you map it out wisely. And that means that when they do send you their demo or their first record or whatever they've done with that money, they have some strength to go to you and you have some confidence in them. And that is something that based on my, you know, historical experience with running a label that, that ended up having some challenges and also working with so many labels over the years, you know, we are always investing in things sometimes really emotionally. Mm, um, yeah. And that's the, that puts added risk on our business. And I think independents tend to share the, the greater burden of that because they're developing smaller bands. They don't have the leeway that the major record companies do. And so, you know, how can we, I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue to build possibly partnerships with certain labels or, you know, any label should know that I'm available if they want to talk about ideas, but, you know, perhaps there might be a good model that we can build on. And that's what I do also see happening in games and and design and technology where venture capitalists particularly look at successful Kickstarter projects or, or running a successful Kickstarter project as sort of a prerequisite for their round of investment. And I think that that can be a, a healthy way to look at things, sort of if in a parallel world with labels and artists. So no, those are the sort of overarching themes that I'm thinking about and, and, and sharing, you know, as I'm talking to people within the music community. And there's going to be a long future. Music is essential. We all know that. Like, it's, it's not going away. It's critical means for expressing ourselves and for hearing things and learning about things. So how can we help it? last and, and how can Kickstarter hopefully be a part of that is, is what I'm, I'm thinking about mostly. Well, you wrap that up so nicely for me. I have to <laughs> end the interview here, even though I could talk to you all day yes. because that was just very nice. I'm, I'm not going to, I can't put a bow on it any better than that. Molly Newman is the head of music at Kickstarter. Molly, thanks so much for joining us on the future of what today? I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you. So thank you so much.
was This Time It Will by Jeff Hansen. You're listening to The Future of What. We're talking to Jack Stratton of Wolfpack. Jack, welcome to The Future of What. Thank you. So I'm so excited to have you on today. We are talking about, I mean, this is sort of a theme that goes throughout my show, but we're interested in artists who are really doing a great job of having careers in this weird modern age that we have where it's not straightforward anymore. It's not just get signed to a record label, put out a record every two years, tour, you know, that sort of very straightforward world that, you know, the music business used to be a while ago. And I feel like you guys are one of those bands that's kind of doing it. And it's very impressive the way that you sort of cobbled together this career. Thanks. Yeah, it's a lot. You know, I've learned a lot from listening to your podcast and that there is a subset of people who want to just keep playing the game, the infinite game, just to keep it sustainable. That's what we're all about. Mm-hmm. I love that angle. Yeah. So tell us a little bit. I mean, people may know you guys from your Sleepify album, which a few years ago was the silent album on Spotify that got a lot of attention in the media and raised you guys some money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was early 2014. And then we did a tour around the album uh, later that year in the, in the fall free admission tour learned a ton throughout the process because it became this kind of clickbait story so i would wake up every day to my computer just kind of being you slammed with like all the heaviest outlets and then i saved all the emails and next album we dropped i emailed everyone and it was just truly silence. Oh oh my God. (laughs) So I learned, I just learned a ton about how it all works, you know? And so so I, even going forward, I know what it kind of feels like to have a a story like that. Luckily, you know, kind of fun and positive. And I've been thinking a ton, a ton about it since then, especially listening to the Numero group episode on your, your podcast. Mm, Yeah. Just how I got it so wrong at the time. So I I had to look up about Spotify, I guess, about that model. And I looked up our 2013 TuneCore statement, which is what we use. And Spotify was coming in. This is the end of 2013. Spotify was coming in at 150 bucks, you know, on the master. Mm -hmm. And iTunes was coming in at three grand for that, for that month. Right. Where I, where I had the idea. So I was like, oh, so that was why myself and like pretty much every artist was super just anti this this streaming model you know all my friends were on it I was on it so it just it it's like a Wes Anderson movie I think it's huge (laughs) but like no one's actually using it globally or something so now it's like caught on I guess even just this last year maybe it's because we're growing but it eclipsed iTunes. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. This last month I logged in. Like it's crazy now. Yeah. And it's it's so easy compared to the other things I do to, you know, sell music like vinyl. The amount of time I spend on vinyl and the amount of emails and whatnot around that versus Spotify and I'm making more off Spotify. So it's crazy. You know, and then and then the numero group episode like just totally put it in this new perspective. I agree. I think, I mean, I felt while I was interviewing Ken for that episode, I was like, oh man, am I doing this right? I'm not doing this right. I got to like get out of here and go back to the office and fix this. Like, yeah, no, it was, it, he really lit a fire. I think a lot of people have responded to that too, but it's true. But I, I also think you're, you know, you're right for you, but you're also right for the industry because the industry has changed in the last, just in the last few years, just in the last couple of years, Spotify has just jumped forward and become something totally different than it was when we all first were being cautious, you know, because we're all like, well, I don't know, it sounds really bad. And my statements are tiny. And that doesn't seem good. Mm -hmm. You know, and why would I put all my eggs in this basket when iTunes is so much better? Right? Yeah, but I think it's definitely we've seen this massive change, you know, Spotify outstrips our iTunes by a lot monthly. Yeah. At, At the time, it was super confusing. Like, and, and I would watch the Daniel Eck interviews on YouTube and just be like, God, this guy's lying to me. <laughs> and now I watch him like, oh, my God, he's a prophet. Or, yeah. You know, so right. it's just I guess that's how you change people's perspective is paying them. Yeah. It's nuts. And and another aspect of it was I never once shared a Spotify link. All our catalog was on there. And after the Numero Group interview, I was like, 
this is probably our biggest amount of eyeballs checking out the band, you know, that Spotify page. And I've never promoted it once. It's just yeah. kind of, yeah. What well, imagine if I did promote it. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I know. I know exactly. It's, it's really making us all think about that. Mm -hmm. But you in general, I'm very impressed with you because first of all, you seem to think about the music business part of this a lot. And also you're, you're willing to take some risks. So tell me about doing a free admission tour. How, how did that work? It was pretty, it was kind of stupid. I mean, I, I, I mean, at the time I was saying we were going to go where it was streamed the most. That was part of the initial idea. Mm -hmm. to, you know, it's one of, one of the aspects of why people would do it. And Spotify was promising their insights platform like within a month or something, you know, you know, on the artist's website, which I think it just came out and it is insanely cool, mm -hmm. but it, it didn't come out at the time. So we just kind of picked our based on Bandcamp sales, you know, and we, and we went around and I, the, the, the actual mechanics would just, I would just email a cool venue in the town with the a few of the headlines and they were, they were stoked to do it. They either just charged us a couple hundred bucks or let us do it for free because of the story. Wow. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then just like the emails, I would go back to them and ask for like, you know, I had this crazy idea of what it costs to play a room and like 500 bucks. Right. You know, and then it was back to like the 60, <laughs> 60, 40s and stuff like that. Right. I was like, I know, I, I know the deal, how much it actually costs, but you know, everyone's going to make their money. So yeah, I, I didn't really know typical club deals or I knew like the Ann Arbor ones before that. So I was just kind of going in naively and kind of getting what I was asking for. But I guess it was just because of the press. Right. They expected you guys to fill a room. That's what they were oh, probably yeah. banking on. And did you, I mean, on that tour, were you, were you pulling in a lot of people? Oh yeah. Yeah. There were, it was insane. Yeah. So yeah, that I, yeah, they were, they were making money. I mean, yeah, maybe it was a weeknight and they, they knew they could fill it. But yeah, those were all sold out, if you can call it that, if it's free. So another thing I think is really interesting about you guys is you're a minimalist funk band. I mean, that's how I've heard you described. Yeah. So you're not exactly like the typical sound right off the bat. You're not a rock band. You're not a sort of straight alternative indie rock thing, pop, whatever. So it's really fascinating that you've made so many interesting decisions about how to market yourselves and how to, you know, move your career forward because you're really not coming from a standard place. Like, you know, if there's X number of fans for rock music and then there's X number of fans for minimalist funk, I'm, I'm guessing that's going to be a smaller number <laughs> just in general. Right, right. Yeah, that label, there's a particular type of song we like to capture the spirit of, which were these Wardell Kazare sessions, like Mr. Big Stuff, was was one of his sessions mm -hmm. where you listen to like Stevie or Earth, Wind and Fire and they're insanely layered and lush. And you're like, well, yeah, I could never do that. I don't have access to that. But the Wardell Kazare ones are drums, bass, guitar and organ. And it's like there's nothing to hide behind there. You just listen to it. It's like this is killing my mix. And it's just these four instruments. And it's the 70s. So then trying to also do that with just a few instruments and get a bang and rhythm track without the crutch of layering, even though you couldn't really call it a crutch with like Stevie Wonder or something. It's, it's, it's not, but there's no X factor with the minimalist thing. So we've tried to do that a few times with a few songs. And then, the, the, then that started being like the first line in a sentence about the band minimalist funk, which is great, you know, what, whatever. So as far as building the fan base off that, I mean, I mean, I like to think of it as anyone who would be into the documentaries that have come out about the rhythm sections. Mm -hmm. Like anyone who likes that on any level would probably be into our group because it's very much about that style of making records and e even even the marketing or business aspect. It's like albums and the vinyl does well. So those documentaries have. It's just such a cool. Such a cool story, the, the rhythm section model. Mm -hmm. It sounds really fun as a musician because there's all this variety built in with the artists. You know, you're not locked into a, a front man. Yeah, I love that. So you guys always have different vocalists playing with right. you. And then what do you do on tour? You have a bunch of different vocalists who come on tour. 
Yeah, yeah. We have the main dude we featured, Antoine Stanley. He he comes out to most of the shows now. And a guy in the rhythm section can sing really well, Theo Katzman, and he'll sing. And then another friend, Joey Dosick, this last tour, he opened the shows and then came on and kind of did a set of the stuff he's written for the band. So yeah, it's it makes for a very entertaining show, kind of based on the Stax review. I think it's in Norway, the particular video. Mm-hmm. But it's it's all the Stax artists with the rhythm section, Booker T and the MGs, and they do their own set. And it's just so entertaining because it's these 20 minute sets. If you don't like this one, you you'll like the next one, you know. So it it's got this built in arc to it. So we're gonna we're gonna get more into that style of show. Yeah, I love that. And have you pursued getting different vocalists in different cities? You know, someone who lives in a certain city that you're going to? Not for the live show. We we do it with like horn players. Mm. We'll, we'll bring out some local horn section or something. That's really fun. And in New York, it yeah, it goes haywire in New York. The the guest vocalists and stuff like that. Oh yeah, d- definitely. I once actually I was lucky. I mean, now I know I was lucky. I didn't know at the time. I saw Amy Winehouse perform at Joe's Pub. It was her first U.S. show, and her backing band was the Dap Kings. Nice. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was an insane show, and I was just like, and she was petrified. She, like, looked like she was going to cry the whole time, which was kind of upsetting, but the Dap Kings were like, I just focused on that. I was like, these guys are, this is the real deal. Yeah, that when that came on the radio, that was huge for me, just the Dap Kings and the drummer Homer Mm -hmm. and kind of that synergy between Gabe Ross engineering and Mark Ronson's like hyping the song for radio. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what we try to do, try to embody both of those people at once. That is really cool. Put it in my pocket, 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 put it in
was Back Pocket by Wolfpack. You're listening to The Future of What? If you're enjoying this program, like us on Facebook and become a subscriber on iTunes. So, okay, let's talk about Kickstarter because you guys had a new album in 2016 and you funded it with Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you made a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because, you know, no one, <laughs> we just, like I abandoned a traditional PR campaign just because, you know, we, we do all right. It just kind of flew under the radar, you know? So, yeah, it's, I mean, I love Kickstarter. I've been doing them since 2011. And that, that pledge interview on your podcast really got me thinking, though. Yeah, they're smart. I really think what they're doing is very smart. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and just just trying to get the Bandcamp downloads through Mailchimp is like a harrowing thing now. So <laughs> the fact that it's all built in there with the sound scan, yeah, they're 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 that that got me thinking. Kickstarter is awesome though. The way the design of the site and how cheap it is to use, you know, or or their fees. Yeah, yeah. And I, we just did a Kickstarter ourselves to move some overstock that we had in our office. But it's, I mean, incredibly easy to use, incredibly easy and fun. I mean, lots of, now they have Kickstarter Live, so you can do, right. you know, whatever little weird skit comes to mind. Or I know you guys did something. What did you do? It was like a... Oh, we did. Yeah, we did a telethon. A telethon, right. <laughs> for the last, yeah, like that last day on Facebook Live. And it was insanely effective. Like, I couldn't even believe how fast the pledges were coming in. Oh, wow. Did you guys wear, like, turtleneck sweaters and totally look like it was the 70s? It, I want to <laughs> ramp it up each year because it was so fun and so much more effective than doing a release show. Oh, wow. Where your potential reach is the amount of people in that room. Right. And, and I mean, this was so fun. And it was a great pitch to musicians in town to come and play on the telethon because it's not a show. It's not a high pressure thing. So people were coming through. It was just, a, it was really fun and not nearly as stressful and way more effective, which, which is a great recipe. I mean, I have to say, I am really impressed with you because I get emails. I got an email not that long ago from somebody who said they were a fan of the show but, you know, they wish that I would tell the truth, which was if you make great music and you put it on the Internet, then it blows up and there's a bidding war. Huh. I know. And I was like, uh, did I get hit on the head and wake up in 1993? Like, what? Well, <laughs> so what when was the last time there was say? a bidding war? That really what you need to do in order to be a successful artist is just make great music and put it on the Internet. Hmm. And I, I'm excited to talk to you because, first of all, you sound like you've got a real grasp of the business part. And second of all, you're like super willing to try a whole bunch of stuff. And you're you're not like resting. You're not like, OK, I'm going to be at home for a while. And, you know, when you guys over there who wrote about us when we did the Sleepify thing, you, when you want us again, you can call me. <laughs> like, <laughs> doesn't sound like that's what you're doing. No, no, it's a, it's an e-hustle. You know, you got to get your Gmail chops together. You got to be willing to make the cold FaceTime to, you know, the head of, no, I'm just kidding. I've never cold FaceTimed anyone. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I wonder about it because I do deal with like with, with Antoine or our bassist Joe Dart. You could, you, I've done it. I literally just point the phone at them and go live at them doing something and it goes viral. So that level of talent, I kind of see what that person emailing you is saying where, you want to be dealing with just people you could point a phone at and <laughs> that's really all the, all the work. Right. But, right. well, don't we all, I mean, it, it, but the problem is if it was that easy, we would all be, you know, millionaires. That would be <laughs> not a problem. But, and my point is just, listen, the people who are making it using the internet are people who are hustling. Like they're working really hard. You know, these YouTube sensations, they're not somebody who put one video on YouTube once and sat back and waited. There are people who put videos on YouTube every day for like six years. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's they're working. Yeah. The the positive side of that would be what is truly harder, the live hustle or the Internet hustle. And so once you once you think of it that way, you know, if you if you think about like the one video that's going to do really well, that's a lot easier than playing one show maybe. So I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to say. You got, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I want to think like that person that emailed you, like I should be moving all my resources to Spotify because it's no work. You know, it's like, oh, I guess Wolfpack's in Japan now because they just open there. So it's like trying to get CDs going in Japan is like, I'm trying to work it out with these licensors over there and I'm in way over my head. You know, I don't, I don't know <laughs> what is going on. So I'm coming to terms with the fact that it has been a lot of work, even though I'm constantly trying to pass it off as not a lot of work, but it it, it is. Yeah. Right. You know, I think that person is not dumb. I think that person is just a regular American. And, you know, we have this narrative in America about, you know, you got discovered at the drugstore, you got discovered walking down the street, you got, you know, someone saw you playing hoops and the next thing you know, you're in the NBA. You know, it's like these sort of overnight sensation stories. And the internet has kind of amplified that because people don't see how much work it takes to get, you know, it's like you don't hear about a YouTube sensation until they're a sensation, right? Let's say. Right, right. So you missed the 468 videos that they just put out, you know? Yeah. Before everybody noticed them and they had a million fans or whatever. So it's like there is always so much hard work. So it's like I'm just appreciating you guys because you seem to be not only putting in the hard work, but like being super creative about it and taking advantage of all these services that have popped up. I mean, you just made $100,000 on Kickstarter fully under the radar. Like who knew about that? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it, it feels really cool and it's really fun. And, it, and like you're saying, it's been to the prediction incremental over the last five years. And that makes me feel safe and I wouldn't want to skyrocket you know, you could Jack Conte from Patreon talks about that in an interview where it's it's really dangerous to do that. And in fact, the like I can almost tell where we'll be January first of next year, and then even the next year potentially, and then people like perceive us as a a band kind of you know in two years. But to try to overnight sensation it at any point would would be a bad idea. I don't even I don't even know if it really happens to like DIY artists. Yeah, the the crazy spike ones usually have like an international team around it. I'm just thinking of unless it's like famous for being really bad or or there's some viral <laughs> element, you know? Right, right. Unless it's Kardashian style. Right, right. Yeah, famous for being famous. Right. But although, you know, hey, I I'm not going to knock them because I've heard they work really hard too. So, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a great story about when I moved to LA, I was hustling in comedy too, like music hadn't taken off. Mm. So I guessed Bob Odenkirk's email, who's... You guessed it? Yeah, yeah. He's like George Martin of... For people who don't know, he wrote uh, Living in a Van Down by the River and discovered Tim and Eric. He's known as like this gatekeeper champion of good comedy. So I sent him three of my videos... And then he replies back really funny, like one sentence email. I'm like, oh, my God. So then <laughs> then I wait. I'm like, I'm not going to reply. You know, this is like a weird minimalist interaction. Then three months later, <laughs> three months later, he goes again, really funny <laughs> Just on the same thread. Uh -huh. so I'm like, So I'm like, OK, I'm going to email him. So I like wait a month and I'm like, I want to pitch you something. He, and then he never got back to me because I, you know, better call Saul and all that. Oh, yeah. But I'm just, I'm just cruising. I'm like, you know, got Bob Odenkirk. And then like two weeks ago, the thread opens up and this guy goes, oh, by the way, uh, I just found Wolfpack and I'm not Bob Odenkirk. Sorry, I lied to you. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I was going like three, four years just riding, riding this insane <laughs> confidence it was just not there. So it's really fascinating. Like, you know, I like it was it was you couldn't pay for that. You can take a pill to give you that confidence. Right, so right. <laughs> it was, I, I wish we could all just simulate that somehow. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> but that's that e hustle. You gotta be guessing emails. Yep, yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Well, Jack Stratton of Wolfpack, I, I got to tell you, I'm really looking forward to the next thing that you guys do. I can't wait That's to see sweet. what it is. So thanks so much for being with us today on The Future of What. Thank you. I love the podcast. And that's our show. The music we played today was used by permission. You heard Bratmobile, Wolfpack, Jeff Hansen, and of course our theme song, Mind Your Own Business by The Delta Five. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. For more info on our shows, check out our website at killrockstars.com slash the future of what. 
Our program was engineered by Brent Asbury at Beta Petrol and is produced by Will Watts and Anna McLean. I'm Portia Sabin, president of Kill Rock Stars. See you next week. Tell me your name and what do you do? Elliot. 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 Steve. Uh, Elliot. Smith. I play music. Twenty years ago, uh, Kill Rock Stars put out Elliot Smith's landmark album, Either Or. And we've decided to celebrate the anniversary with six episodes full of uh, stories from folks who knew Elliot. Memories from musicians who are influenced by him. Conversations about the record itself, which might just be his most important release. And even a few words uh, from the man responsible for that record. I'm Sean Cannon, and from Kill Rock Stars in the guest list, it's Say Yes, an Elliott Smith podcast. She sent me in the mail a mix cassette, and I wore that thing out in my car, and... I just became such a, a big fan of him. You know, I sort of heard his music for the first time, and the next project was Good Will Hunting. <laughs> I lost my virginity listening to Elliot Smith. <laughs> I could have listened to him on an acoustic guitar with nothing else and been satisfied, but then it just also turned out he was like, you know, the one-man Beatles, so if he wanted to <laughs> be able to display that too, and why wouldn't you if you could do it? I'm pretty sure I would listen to his music for the rest of my life. And there's only two or three artists I can think of that that's true about. I actually heard Elliot's music. It wasn't through his records. It was through my brother, who was a huge fan and would play his songs all the time in the living room. I wish that I had had access to him in the process of writing these songs, just watching him come up with these things, because they're too beautiful. And I wish I I could access that kind of... uh, I like melody, and my songs revolve around that. And I don't think melody is more important, but that's just kind of my favorite thing. You can hear all that and more starting February 3rd. Say yes.